Hey everyone, it's me again, Mr. David. I'm here to give you part two of the Chinese uh, Civil War. So in part one, we established the major causes of the Chinese Civil War, and we went through the first stage of fighting all the way to 1937. And if you recall, a lot of odds stacked against the communists. However, because of the leadership of Mao, because of the at least beginnings of trying to educate the Chinese citizens about the benefits of communism and the benefits of land reform, as well as some GMD nationalist heirs, more, most specifically the opposite of that, not trying to do much to help with those issues, um, we were able to see amidst all the odds and amidst everything stacked against them, the communists were able to survive the first round. Now we're going to take place right from 1937. We'll start with what happens in the Sino-Japanese War or you know World War II between Japan and China. And then we'll look into the last part or the second part of the Chinese Civil War. And then we'll talk about the effects. This is a little bit shorter than the first one. But again, um, I thought it was necessary to break it down a little bit, make it a little more manageable. And again, just a reminder, this is still case study one of our civil wars unit and the region we're still looking at is the region of Asia. So let's give a little bit of an overview, basically some of the things that we discussed earlier. So if we remember, a lot of discontent in China, um, all kind of leading up to a revolution in 1911. However, as we said earlier, this revolution is unfinished. And although there's this idea of a democracy that's supposed to come into play, that doesn't actually happen. And so because of that, we're hesitant and we're kind of cautious and we have this weird kind of limbo period where we're sitting around. We also remember that the nationalists and the communists do team up in the 20s. And when they do, they are able to push out the warlords and they are able to become the effective government, the nationalists, that is. However, we know that they were ineffective and they were not giving those changes to the uh, peasants that was seen as being necessary. Um, as all this is going on, again, this one group, the Chinese Communist Party, started off relatively slow, but they have begun to rise uh, pretty substantially in popularity. And that goes a lot with Mao and his rising popularity, uh, but also the popularity of the communists as a whole. And again, the last thing we kind of talked about were the reasons why the communists were able to survive the Chinese Civil War, um, at least the first part, even though the odds were so much stacked against them and everything was much more tipping in the favor of the um, nationalists. And again, if you remember in 1937, we see the formation of the Second United Front, which is what is depicted in this image. Um, and we see the communists on one side, the nationalists on the other, and this is what's necessary in order to fight the Japanese. So let's talk about the pace of the war for the Sino-Japanese War in World War II. And again, there's a lot to this, but we're really going to be talking about this more in the context of the Chinese Civil War. So first off, we do want to remember something. The Japanese are very forceful. They're very aggressive, very strong military power, very ruthless, etc. And the nationalists, they are the major group that is seen as being the head of the government. However, during World War II and during this fight against the Japanese, the nationalists do little to resist the Japanese. And so this is going to kind of bring a lot of questions for many who are saying, hey, look, he's supposed to be fighting them. They're the problem. We need to get rid of the Japanese and stop their aggression. Why aren't the nationalists doing more about this? Some of this relies on the fact that the nationalists hope that their ally, the United States, would help them win the war, primarily due to the fact that, obviously, we do have the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, but the United States was dedicated and committed to protecting U.S. trade interests in China and also ensuring, to an extent, that China uh, would be strong enough to resist communism. So those are some of the things that were in Shanghai Shek's mindset. However, during the war, we see continued economic issues for the nationalist government. Um, the tax revenue, a lot of it was lost. 
There was issues of inflation, overprinting of money, other types of problems that were coming into play here. And so with that being the case, um, this is, again, adding less legitimacy to the um, nationalist government. What we also have is corruption. We have factions within the nationalist army. They had lost land, and really up to this point into the wartime, they had really started to lose substantial public support. On the alternate side of things, the communists are going to take a much more active role in the fighting against the Japanese. And it will really be the communists that will liberate a large number of Chinese cities from the Japanese. And as they do, and as they liberate these Chinese towns, what they're doing is not only getting them out of Japanese control, but they're also, again, going back to Mao's kind of revolutionary warfare. They're educating the people, telling them about the positives of communism for China and trying to kind of push them um, in that overall right direction. As this is happening, they are gaining peasant support. And some of this has to go with the fact that peasants are hopeful and they hear kind of the communist message and they say, wow, that seems like a good idea. Some of this also has to do with the fact that peasants also support them because they see the communists as taking on the vast majority of the fighting against the uh, Japanese. And so that's going to be incredibly important. Another reason why the communists will continue to grow in popularity has to do with their ideas of equality. And again, in a country that was really enshrined in so much inequality between women and the poor and the rich and all the rest of these things, the reality that the communist model calls for such equality is going to mean it's going to um, give it a lot of support. Another kind of factor that's leading to continued support for the communists is the fact that Mao provides sound leadership, and Mao is also seen as someone that's providing sound leadership uh, during World War II. And again, a lot has been studied recently about how much of an impact the communists actually made in the fighting against the Japanese, and, and um, you know, it's kind of varied, uh, but their role probably wasn't all telling of the victory, but at the same time, um, it did contribute at least a little bit. And at least that perception was there that while the communists were kind of stepping up, even though their military was probably weaker and definitely far less people uh, than the nationalists, they were the ones that were doing the majority of the fighting against uh, the Japanese. So after war ends, it's time to pick up on the second phase of the Civil War that's only going to last for a few years between 1946 and 1949. So first off, after World War II ends, we see kind of a different position. And so when World War II started, it was clear the nationalists were definitely the more popular group. They had a very strong support. Uh, they were definitely seen and were the clear leaders of China. When World War II ends, that has kind of shifted. Their support has weakened and the Communist Party has much, much more strengthened. What that also means is that because of the experience that the communists have gained, as well as because they have more troops now, because they have some more support, etc., it's time to now move into the next phase of Mao's fighting, and that's to move into much more conventional fighting away from the guerrilla. Again, guerrilla was seen as a good first move when there were less people, but now that they have more, it's time to turn to the conventional fighting. Now... The second phase of the war is also much different because it goes from being an internal conflict to a much more international conflict. And that's because by the time the second part of the Chinese Civil War is occurring, we are in the Cold War. And so again, now both sides have something at stake if we're thinking about the world between capitalism and communism. And so again, um, you know, once World War II ends, the United States is the top power. Um, but, I mean, something like uh, the biggest country in world population-wise, China, going to communism would obviously be a huge blow. And so this becomes a much more international affair uh, between the two sides. Now, the other thing is because it's an international affair and because this is during the Cold War, the United States is definitely going to be a part of this. 
And what's going to happen here is that the United States is going to come in and try to achieve a diplomatic solution. And the idea here is that the nationalists will be the kind of heads of government, as was the case, but they'll kind of sign a truce with the nationalists and they'll be able to kind of rule and share power together. And that's seen as being a far more likely solution. That's what kind of you kind of see in the image here. Well, that's not necessarily going to be the case because in reality, neither side was really willing to share power. And so this diplomatic solution is going to move away. And instead, what we see is war taking place. Now, a couple of things to realize. Although after World War II, the popularity of the communists had increased, the nationalists still had a major advantage. And that major advantage was they had far more troops in comparison to the communists. They also had much more modern weaponry. And so that was kind of a big difference between the two sides. And so again, even after World War II ends, although the communists, you know, they're looking better, the tide is still tipping in the nationalist favor. Uh, in this image, by the way, we see a na we see the nationalist and communist uh, representative with a U.S. representative trying to kind of come to some type of um, agreement. Now, um, again, only a few years of this initial uh, war time, and so now we're going to look at what it looks like at the beginning of the war. So first off, the first major place that we're going to see um, fighting in the second half of the Civil War taking place is in uh, Manchuria, um, a much kind of disputed zone taken over by the Japanese. Now Japanese are gone, so the question becomes who's going to take over Manchuria? Manchuria, very strong industrially, very strategic for either side to get. Now what happens here, and you kind of might remember this, it's kind of an odd deal, but after the United States drops the first atomic bomb on Japan and on August 6th, the uh, Soviets will make the decision to enter into the war against the Japanese. And this is one of the factors that leads the United States to drop the second atomic bomb. But the point here is that the communists of the Soviet Union, when they come in uh, to Manchuria, although they're only there for about a, a couple of days, one of the things that they're going to do is they're going to leave weapons for the communists in the hopes of them being more equipped in this battle against the nationalists. Now, not to neglect that, that that's significant, and we definitely see the Soviets supporting the communists. The reality is that support is nothing in comparison to the U.S. support that's given to the nationalists, uh, which is with money, with weapons— uh, not really troops necessarily, but the United States does really want to make sure that Shanghai Shek and the Nationalists are able to become uh, the clear leaders of uh, China. Um, in the first part of the war, what we see is the communists on the defensive. And again, that has to go with a lot of the things that we've kind of talked about uh, before with weapons and um, troop numbers and all the rest of these things. Um, and it's the nationalists are going to be able to establish kind of a decent presence in Manchuria because they are going to be on the offensive in this beginning part. However, what's important is the nationalists will lose support in Manchuria. And again, why? Very similar to what we've already been talking about before. Because they are not willing to institute land reform, because they are not willing to kind of work with the peasants, and because they don't seem to be kind of well-led or anything, that's going to lead to them kind of losing the support from this whole dynamic altogether. Now, the other thing is the United States is still involved here. Obviously, they want the nationalists to win, but at the same time, they realize that if the nationalists lose, they're in really, really big problems, and they realize the communists are becoming more popular, the nationalists are kind of fading, and so the question becomes, okay, you know, if we can't have the nationalists by themselves, we certainly cannot have the communists by themselves. So we should try to establish a kind of um, a truce so both these sides can kind of rule uh, uh, together. And so in 1946, we'll see one truce um, established that will actually end up not working out. But in 1947, we do see um, another truce established. And so what's important...
So what's important about this truce is that these truce does give an advantage to the Chinese Communist Party in 1947. And the reason why is it gives them a little bit of time to regroup. And it gives them a little bit of time to kind of figure out what's their next move of attack and what's the best way to go. So this time of the truce of 1947, what it's going to do is it's going to get them the ability to train their forces and get them more ready to actually be able to fight in the war. What we also see is that in the places that the communists had established their rule in, they start to take uh, more initiative and get the people more educated on the land reform uh, they are going to introduce. And again, this is after the war. It's already just devastating for China. These are people that have been living in poverty and been living in really bad issues for a long period of time. So these ideas are causing more and more people to, again, turn to the communists, become more interested in what they're proposing, what they're offering, etc. By July of 1947, the communists are much more prepared. And one example of that is they are no longer the Red Army. They now become the PLA or the People's Liberation Army. And they realize, hey, you know what? Let's go back to guerrilla warfare. Let's try to do this guerrilla warfare and uh, because of our numbers disadvantage. Let's disrupt and let's conduct kind of a sabotage campaign. And so they're going to be able to do so. And so this is going to kind of really disrupt the war efforts of uh, the nationalists. And so what happens here is that that coupled with the nationalist loss of support is going to lead to the communists being able to gain control of Manchuria and a pretty significant loss of troops for the nationalists. What we also see here is into 1948, we continue to see the PLA achieving victories. And again, um, what they're really able to do is they're able to disrupt the nationalists from being able to get their supplies and other things. And then what next happens is that they're able to actually transition into conventional um, war at this time. Um, amidst the next about year, the tide is clearly tipping in the favor of the communists until finally the nationalists are no longer um, Shanghai Shek will flee, and what we see is on October 1st of 1949, Mao Zedong will officially declare China to be kind of called the People's Republic of China under communist control. And so this is the moment when China, amidst everything, has officially become a communist country. Now, what happens to the nationalists? Well, many are killed in the fighting, but not all are gone. And so what we see is that um, a lot of the nationalists will flee to Taiwan, which is a nearby island of China, and they are going to establish what they are going to say is the real government of China, which is going to be the Republic of China. Now, we're going to talk about this more when we get to Mao's China and the Cold War, but this discrepancy uh, between the two is going to be really, really monumental. Now, it's important you realize, and again, this is a little bit of a precursor, the People's Republic of China is the real China. Vast majority of people, you know, all the rest. But the United States and other Western powers do not want to give legitimacy to this government. And so what's going to happen here is they're going to actually give legitimacy to the Republic of China and the Nationalists in Taiwan, even though they don't have much Chinese support. Um, so here becomes the China that we talk about. And again, we'll talk about this a little bit more, but um, there's a decent amount of land changes that will occur and expansion under Mao. And then what you see here on the right side of the map, that small little island is Taiwan. And Taiwan is going to be where the nationalists uh, will flee to. And even today, that issue between China and Taiwan continues to be one that is um, unsettling. Now is a good time to talk about, okay, well, why did the communists win? Why did the nationalists lose? And again, uh, we've already kind of covered a lot of this, but at the same time, this is a good time to kind of recap, kind of put the bow on everything and kind of tighten it up into a nice little package. First off, if we're talking about guerrilla warfare, and we're talking about the significance of guerrilla warfare for a civil war, really for any war, Chinese Civil War is, is really case in point of that. 
Mao realized the numbers disadvantage for the communists. He realized that the nationalists were far better trained, far better equipped, and so he was much willing to go to guerrilla tactics, which worked much, much more um, effectively uh, for the communists. And that also goes towards the revolutionary warfare uh, that he puts into play. And again, that's that transition from guerrilla for kind of the long-term stuff. And then once you build up, moving into a much more conventional role. Um, we also see on the same kind of note, the leadership of this uh, Red Army, which becomes the PLA. Its major general is going to be a guy by the name of Lin Bao. Um, and again, really, really good leadership. What this also means is that not only is this an effective fighting force, but this is also a fighting force that has high morale and high confidence. And towards the later part of the uh, Chinese Civil War on the opposite end, the nationalist support had gotten so low that what we saw was nationalist troops actually fleeing to the other side. So very powerful stuff here. We also have to realize the role of Mao. And again, some of this has to do with his military leadership, but also his leadership and his ideology. And again, his commitment to making this a movement about the peasants and kind of making the communist model fit for what he thought was appropriate for China. And again, we're going to talk about that more when we get to uh, the Mao unit. But at the same time, it's important that we realize that same ideology and that same effectiveness that we see in the Civil War is the same thing we're going to see as he establishes his Chinese uh, state. Um, again, this uh, communist ideas goes for the ideology but a lot of this has to do with its spread, and a lot of this has to do with land reform, uh, which is really going to speak well to these peasants and the majority of the Chinese population who have had it really, really rough for a long period of time. Um, intelligence was also kind of critical. Um, the PLA and the communists were able to establish a pretty good link of intelligence, which made them knew pretty well uh, where the nationalists were heading, what was their next move, etc. So again, that role is important. Um, as far as the nationalists, the nationalists have their own failures, which also mean reasons for communist success. So first would be political failures. Again, did not try to institute democratic change, did not try to really be an open group, did not try to really institute anything different from what had been the case before. Also very corrupt, very bad leadership. Economic failures, well, many, but again, inflation was really, really bad, which meant they couldn't pay their bills. We also never saw them willing to institute land reform, which we knew was a big, big concern for the Chinese peasants. Finally, we see military failures, and again, what we see here is that um, Chang's troops, although they were big, were not very well trained or of high quality and again towards the end of the war we start to see his troops fleeing towards the communist side and so that's really really a big deal um we also see this dynamic which is that Chiang Kai-shek was a big micromanager and he wasn't really willing to let kind of more experienced generals or smarter generals kind of take control of the situation and again I would argue that micromanaging um, especially micromanaging people that know what they're doing um, oftentimes leads to serious problems and issues. We also see here that, again, this idea of Chinese communism, also propaganda that is instituted during the Civil War in support of Mao, and we'll see that trend continuing as we uh, move forward and Mao creates his uh, communist state. Okay, we also have to talk about not only what is the effect and the results um, but also, what does this mean for foreign support? Again, as I said, the second part of this war really becomes about the foreign support system. So first off, as we realized, the U.S. supported the nationalists, gave billions of dollars in aid, huge amounts of supplies. The reality is not enough for Chiang Kai-shek to capitalize and utilize upon. And so we really have to realize that was a big, big mistake and obviously shows that basically you could have given Shanghai Shek any sort of amount of money. It might not have amounted into much. Obviously, as we would expect, 
The Soviet Union gave their support to the Chinese Communist Party, um, but it was not really to the extent that the United States gave support to the nationalists. And so, again, we have to kind of uh, realize that it is much less. So if we're thinking about how much a foreign support impacted a civil war, well, in long, in short, it, nece it probably didn't that much because at the end of the day, if it would have, comparatively, the nationalists would have won with all that U.S. supplies and the, and the uh, communists would have lost. Um, so again, you always want to be thinking about that. What is the impact of foreign support on civil wars? And again, I'm not so sure this applies necessarily. Uh, by the way, this is an image. This is from a little bit later, but again, a little bit of a precursor. Here we see Stalin and Mao when they meet each other in 1950. Um, although these are going to be seen as the two top communist countries, they are not exactly going to get along too well. So I look forward to talking about that with you um, during the school year. Now let's talk about the results of the war. And as I do this, I'll kind of go through the results for each of the various countries and the way this goes. Well, the most obvious result is that now China is under communist control. And again, it's a big, big deal. And so now what we have is a society that is communist. And as depicted on the right-hand side, this is a U.S. Um, comic. But what we see here is that, again, this is obviously very fearful as um, the balance of the Cold War now starts to shift a little bit towards the Soviet Union. What we will see here is that this is going to turn into a communist society. And we'll see the way that goes, but Mao will institute land reform. He will institute communist and socialist reforms and things like that. And so what we see is a big, big shift, especially a big shift considering the way China had been structured for years and centuries, really, which was that woman held a very inferior status. And this was really an unequal society. Now, again, I'm not saying that China just magically becomes equal under Mao, but at the same time, you're at least supporting much different ideals. Next is, again, something you want to realize. That this new communism that will take place in China is different than what was taking place in the Soviet Union because Mao will focus his attention on the peasants. And so he realizes that China does not have a lot of industrial workers. Doesn't that, it, it, That's going to happen, but he doesn't necessarily see that as being the big deal. He'd much rather focus on the peasants. And so that becomes kind of the big, big deal. However, this is still a single-party state. And so even though the focus is on the peasants, this is still a situation where Mao is seen as godlike and all-powerful. And we have individual rights that are neglected, ignored, freedoms suspended, all the rest of these type of things. And again, we'll talk about that more as we go through, but this is a very, very different China than we've seen before. Next, an important concept, for you to realize is that after China becomes communist, the Cold War becomes globalized. And again, um, we'll talk about this more as we go through, but originally when the Cold War starts, the focus for both sides is on Europe. And again, for the United States, it's keeping Western Europe capitalist and their friends. For the Soviet Union, is keeping Eastern Europe communist and their friends. Well, that's going to pretty much set up. So now, all of a sudden, in 1949, we have China becoming communist. And so now the Cold War has moved to Asia. And so we'll move into this, but again, for both sides, that has real and serious implications. For the USSR, at least immediately, this is a communist victory. And so if it's a communist victory, it's a leader. It's, it's a victory for them. Now, even from the onset, although the Soviet Union is excited for China to be communist, we're going to see that the two are going to really deteriorate in their relations. And originally we see, okay, you know, relations are okay, but what's going to happen here is that uh, uh, their relations will become much worse. And we'll talk about why, but China kind of had one view of communism. The Soviet Union had another. Soviet Union saw themselves as being the clear heads of communism. The Chinese didn't want to be second, and so that kind of creates some weird kind of tensions and dynamics moving forward. Eventually, what we're going to see is a big movement in the Cold War, which is going to be the Sino-Soviet split, the split between China and the USSR, 
um, which is going to be a really interesting time where we see the two communist countries not getting along. For the U.S., at least originally, a lot of anxiety as the U.S. feels that they lost China. One of the ways in which they're going to try to fight against this is that they will refuse to recognize the PRC, the People's Republic of China, this new name for China under Mao, as a legitimate state. And instead, they are going to acknowledge the Republic of China, where the nationalists have gone in Taiwan, as being the real and legitimate government, which is going to mean a really, really weird dynamic, especially because in reality, that's not accurate. And the only reason the United States is doing that is because they don't want to give any sort of legitimacy to a communist government. Um, later on, though, especially after the Sino-Soviet split, what we see is that the United States realizes that communism does not necessarily have to mean we have an automatic enemy. And what we're going to see here is that in the in the late 1960s, uh, once the so and into the 1970s, once the relationship between the Soviet Union becomes bad, the United States will practice what is known as ping pong diplomacy. And we'll talk about why it's called ping pong diplomacy. Kind of a funny story, but nonetheless, we see the United States and the Chinese becoming much closer and restoring diplomatic relations. However, at least originally, this is a huge, huge blow for the United States, and this is a shift towards the to the towards um, a much different dynamic for the Cold War. Um, in September and October of 1949, China becomes communist, tilting the balance towards communism in the Soviet Union. In addition, at that same at around that same time, uh, the Soviet Union will finally be able to develop. Uh, nuclear weapons of their own so that will also shift the tide so again kind of a crazy deal and again this country not only being important for how things change within it but also how things look for the cold war anyways hope you enjoyed this now after watching two videos and taking your notes you are now ready to answer the prompt um, on the module so again great talking to you and i'll talk to you soon